Good morning, Star Voyager. Another cosmic day awaits us. Yesterday, we journeyed through the wonders of bitmaps, navigating the constellations of pixels. Today, we shift our trajectory slightly, venturing into the realm of binary counters. Imagine it as laying the foundation for understanding the binary language of the universe. Using our trusty dip switch, we're going to construct a 3-bit binary counter. This is a pivotal step before we launch into the challenging task of mending our docking gear. Ready to play with some switches and send signals across the vastness of our ship's systems? Let's light up the binary stars. I want you to think of each of our switches as an individual bit. Since we have three switches, that means for today's calculator, we will have a total of three bits. When all three are off, we can think of it as representing 0, 0, 0. When all three are on, we can think of it as representing 1, 1, 1. But you haven't learned how to count in binary yet, have you? All right, deep breath, explorer. Let's set our sights on my personal favorite way to represent numbers, binary. In fact, by definition, it's the only method I use. Think of binary as a language that can only use 1 and 0. With our three switches, we have three positions, like three light bulbs in a row. Farthest to the left represents the largest value, and farthest to the right is the smallest. Each of these light bulbs can be either off low, signified by a zero, or on high, signified by a one. Starting from the rightmost bulb, the first bulb represents the number one. The next one to its left stands for the number two, and the leftmost one symbolizes the number four. Now. If only the rightmost bulb is on, your number is 1. If the two bulbs on the left are on and the rightmost is off, your binary reads 110, which translates to 4 plus 2 plus 0 equals 6 in our usual decimal counting. With me so far? Great. Now, we're going to map this cosmic dance of numbers to visual imagery. Depending on the binary sequence our switches spell out, we'll display a distinct bitmap. It's a smart way to confirm that all our switches are in tip-top shape functioning flawlessly. After all, imagine the anticlimax, surmounting all challenges only to falter on our final descent due to a landing gear glitch? Let's not be the comet that dazzles in the sky but disintegrates upon landing. Safety always orbits first. For today's code, we will need a way to display a total of eight bitmaps. So that means we will need to do the following. First, Set up our hardware for the OLED and define inputs for dip switches, etc. Second, make a total of eight bitmaps. Luckily for you, I've already done that. So don't worry about making your own unless you really want to. And third, write a function to be able to calculate which of the eight bitmaps we are going to be displaying. This will technically be zero through seven, since as you know, good programmers prefer to start at zero. Let's think about that a little bit further we will have a total of eight different cases. Case one, where all are off. Case two, where switch one is on and two and three are off. Case three, where one and two are on, but three is off, etc., etc., all the way to case eight, where all three are flipped on. There are a couple different ways we can do this. Maybe the good old if statement? I think this is okay for now. However, if we had more than three digits to deal with, I'm sure you could see how this could get messy quickly. Worry not, Explorer. I've gathered some instructional material that should help alleviate any sense of uncertainty you may have. I've also added this to your mission resources for future reference. Take a look. Hello, hello, and welcome back to day 27 of the 30 Days Lost in Space Adventure Kit Code Explanations. Today is going to be a little bit different than most days. If you, you might be noticing, I have an empty sketch here. Usually when you guys go into the course page, you might see something like this, where you have a piece of code here that you can copy into your IDE, and then obviously hit compile, and it should hopefully work with no issues. But you'll notice today there's two of them. We have the regular code and then we also have a new header file. And going forward, we're gonna be putting all of our bitmaps inside of a nice header file. So instead of having all of this random gibberish in our main file, because obviously that's just a lot of space that's being used, it feels like, on the screen, so it's a little bit easier to read, we're gonna put everything all of our bitmaps that we've created for these lessons into header files. 
So you might be asking yourself, okay, well, how do I go about doing that? How do I go about putting those into a header file? Well, let's first copy the very first sketch like you would normally, if this is the way you're going to be doing it. You can go ahead and copy this one. And then they have this nice little thing here and you can go new tab and you can create the new name for the file. You'll notice right here, it says include switch underscore bitmaps dot H spelled exactly that way with the underscore. If you create it and you don't name it the right thing, you will get a compilation issue. So you can click okay. And then obviously, now that you have this, you can then copy the new code into here. I actually have it from here. So let me go boop, boop, boop. And so you shouldn't, hopefully, if I click verify, there should be no compilation issues because it will notice that there's a switch bitmaps.h that you've included right here. So for today's lesson, we're gonna be showing a couple of new different things. One is gonna be partial bitmaps, where instead of having it be the full screen, you do not have to have it be the full screen. You can actually have a bitmap be whatever size you want, and then specify where you want it to be on the display. So we're gonna be introducing that. We're also gonna be using the dip switch as a three bit binary counter. And for each of those numbers that it can generate, zero through seven, we will be using those numbers to display a relevant piece on the OLED display for exactly that. And of course, the last thing we covered today was to create the include file here, which is a bitmaps.h. So let's quickly go through all of the new code that we're going into today. Obviously, you have this up here. Since we're in the Arduino IDE, it's technically, technically not necessary but just you can keep it in if you want to. It doesn't hurt anything. It will automatically be put in for us. If we go up here, I'm just gonna erase all this, boop, 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 make our stuff nice and easy to read. We have the U8G2lib library that we've been using forever, wire.h. This is all not new, stuff we've talked about before. Create the lander display. Easy peasy, there we go. Finally, we have the new thing here. We're going to include our switch bitmaps.h. Just like we have with wire.h, u8g2lib switch bitmaps.h, when we include it, this is just another file similar to this that has definitions to things. So if you're ever curious, ever wanna look into wire.h, those are all uh, freely available to go and look into. And I highly recommend if you're curious about how they do I2C communications and all that other stuff, um, make your life a lot easier. You can go in and see all the work they did. That's the beauty of open source. Down here below, we have the following. We have switch bitmaps. Now we have a total of eight different numbers that a three bits can produce for us. So if we assume that bit one is going to be the rightmost of the dip switches, bit two is gonna be the middle dip switch, and the third bit is gonna be the very left one, we can have all of them be off in switch zero. We can all of them, we can have the very first one be on um, all the way up to all of them being on, which would be not eight, but seven, because remember we start at zero as programmers. So we have zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And these are all the different places that they can be in. And you'll notice we have switches zero, switches one, switches two. So this is just a simply a array of pointers to the bitmap images that we have in switch bitmaps. Finally, we have the include for our uh, seven segment display. We tell them what pins we're using for the seven segment display. In our case, we're using two and three. And then we're gonna go down here and we're going to use the following to set up the switch bit pins. So the very, First pin is gonna be for the dip switches A0, A1, and A2. The reason we're using A1, A0, and A2, you might be noticing why we're gonna be using analog pins. There's a reason for this, don't worry. Um, normally you would be using digital pins. It doesn't make sense to be using analog pins for this, but when we get to day 29, we will, well, as you'll hopefully shortly see in a couple days, we won't have enough room for all of the pins we want to include on our board. So we're actually going to be able to use, luckily analog pins are backwards compatible as digital pins. Um, digital pins are not 
compatible as analog pins though and since we did not have enough pins on our board on very on the light day 29 when we want to include every single component in our survival kit we have here we needed to make sure that we used everything that we possibly could so we used analog pins because they do technically work as digital pins because when we get to day 29 there will not be any room for them <laughs> otherwise so let's hop down to setup. We have serial begin 9600. Um, you'll also notice we technically don't do any printouts or anything. So if this was removed, technically nothing would break, but it's nice if you want to do a print statement and debug if you're gonna add your own cool stuff, maybe creative day idea. Bitmap number display, we're setting the counter display to just be on a, uh, which is the seven segment display. We're just gonna set it to seven, which is the maximum brightness. And we're going to just clear the display, configure the dip switch, and make the lander display initialize and do all of the things that it needs to in the begin function in here. Which is probably going to be pin mode, is my guess, and some other things. Down here in loop, we have the byte offset for X and Y for our bitmap graphics. Since we're using a partial bitmap, this bitmap that we're using is not 128 by 64 pixels. It is not the entire screen. So we need to specify where we want it to be. Preferably, we could technically not specify it and it would just kind of go up in the top left corner of the screen. Um, instead of it being in the very top left corner, um, we want it to be kind of centered in the middle and somewhere where it makes sense. In fact, technically we want it to be a left down so that we can have some text on screen as well. So what we do to do that is we simply calculate a good X value and a good Y value to make that happen. Here we're just calculating the X and Y offset. Now when we get to this part of the code here, you might know that our functionality of our program is to display up to eight different values that it could possibly be depending on what switches are switched on our dip switch. Now, in order to calculate these values, we could theoretically have eight different if statements where it's like, if this is on and this is off and this is off, then it's this. And if this is on and this is on and this is on, then it's this. And if this is off and this is off and this is off, then it's this. But that would be really gross, and that's not a great way to do things. Um, especially because if we had any more than three, we just exponentially make it worse for every number we add on every additional bit. So if we ever wanted to upgrade this to an eight position dip switch, then it sucks. <laughs> so we don't want to do that. So what we have here is we have this wonderful thing called bitwise shift operators. And what it does is it simply takes, okay, if the value of the very first one that we read, um, which is going to be this left one here, is a 1, then we want to set it to 1, otherwise it's 0. That one's really easy. Because remember, the way this works is if equals equals high, then we want to set it to 1. But if it's not on, we want it to be 0. That makes sense, right? So switch value would be set to 1, 0 would be set to the it if it was off. That makes sense for the very first one. But what do you do about these, right? Because you can't you can't really get these very much. This is where the bitwise shift operators come in. You can basically think of it as it basically sets it to switch value, then is going to be or equal. So read bit one, which is going to be the second one on the bit. And we're going to set, set it to high, uh, or we're going to set it to one if it's high and zero if it's off. But then we're going to shift it over by one. So we put it back in its position and we're going to keep that in switch value. Finally, we read the very last one here. And the reason we're using or equals is because then we can actually calculate it all as one wonderful number. We have the following. Uh, if it's equal to high, then we're going to set it to one. Otherwise we're going to set it to zero. This is all the same for every single one, but then since it's the very next bit, the this bit here, if we didn't bitwise shift it by two, we're going to override what was in this position. So we need to shift it over boop, boop, to this position here. And so by doing that, we're going to create a number and we're going to be able to display it then on our display. So switch value now will be equal to the number, whatever it is. So if all of them are on, we will have it just be like, for example, like one, one, one sort of kind of thing. So what we can do is we can go to down here below and we can say bitmap number display dot show number decimal ex and we can display that switch value on 
our seven segment display. And then finally, depending on which one this matches up with, we have obviously down here, switches so zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and we can know what index that's in. So if it's in, if we know that we want to display the number four, it's going to be five um, in this case. So what we can do is we can do lander display dot first page do lander display dot draw, draw x mbc and we're going to display that image that we've created that bitmap in the switch bitmap image file and we're going to display that centered on the display matching whatever we calculated here and that is it for today for day 27 of the code explanations tomorrow we will be getting into fixing our landing gear and don't worry we will also be using Lots more fun bitmaps, and we will be putting those again in a separate file tomorrow as well. So um, be ready for that. And so without further ado, I look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow. Welcome to the day 27 wiring example video. Okay, things are starting to ramp up now, both in terms of hardware and software, as we continue to build up our landing control system. Today's task brings back a couple of old friends of ours, the seven segment LED numerical display and the three channel dip switch bank that we'll use for mode selection. Now, this is in addition to the OLED from last time that we'll also be using. Looking at the dip switch, since each of the three dip switches has two possible positions on and off, that means that there are a total of eight different combinations or configurations that we can use to invoke eight different modes in our system. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail about that shortly. But for now, let's focus on the hardware wiring connections necessary to bring all of this together. Because free pins on the hero are going to start to become a limited resource as we build up our system, We'll need to juggle things around a little and be somewhat strategic about how we design our connections and layout. Now, as for the OLED display, since the Hero really only provides with us with one way to send the I2C communication protocol that it uses, we'll have to keep that connection unchanged. So the analog A4 and A5 pins will be used just as they have been before. Now, the four digit seven segment display here needs two hero digital output pins. And so we'll connect those two pins, the CLK and the DIO, to pins two and three. So pins two and three down here in the digital row are located as we're looking at it here over on the left. And in this setup, we've chosen to make that connection using these two wires here. Here's the brown wire that's connecting for the CLK connection and this white wire right here for the DIO connection. So those are connected to pins, the CLK to pin three and the DIO to pin two. We're leaving most of the remaining digital pins down here on the hero free. And that's in anticipation them needing to be used in the future as we build up our system. Leaving those free, however, means that we'll need to do something a little bit different than before in order to read the status of our three dip switches. And so you'll note here that what we've chosen to do is to connect the logic test points, that is the points here on the high side of our three logic resistors, our 10 kilo ohm resistors. We've chosen to connect those to three available analog pins up here on this upper row of pins on the Hero. Switches one, two, and three, reading from left to right, we've connected to pins A0, a1 and A2 respectively. And we've accomplished that here using our orange, that's for the A0, our brown for the A1, and our green 
for the A2. Those three jumper wires are connected to the corresponding analog pins up above. The power and the ground connections for all these sub-circuits should be fairly straightforward to, for us to follow now. We've created two common ground buses, this blue line along the bottom and this blue line up along the top of our breadboard, and connected them together into a common bus using these black jumper wires. So this is a commonly available ground to be used uh, by all of our sub-circuits. The bottom one, down here, provides the ground connections for our switch logic resistors and completes the circuit to ground for those when those switches are thrown. The uh, upper one, the upper ground line up here, is available for use by our two displays. So you'll notice that this ground is accessed by the seven segment display at this point right here. And then this jumper provides ground for the OLED. So that's all fairly straightforward and uh, similar to what we've done in the past. The five volt power is accessed by both our displays and by the switch logic using the same red five volt bus along the upper edge of the breadboard. The upper edge here as it's oriented in our view here. And so you can see that this common, uh, we have a, a red wire from the Hero that provides five volts. And then that's distributed to the switches using these three red jumpers. And then using this red wire, we provide power that's available to our, uh, our OLED display. And this red wire right here, it's hiding a little bit that it connects to the same red bus. So that takes care of the issues of, of ground and power. Next, we need to talk about what to expect when we run the sketch that we have written specifically for this setup. The state of the displays will reflect and will change with the positions of the dip switches. Now, as we mentioned before, with eight switch configurations possible, that means we have eight different bitmaps that we're going to choose to display on the OLED. And those images, we can number them sequentially from zero up to seven. And so this image number will in turn be displayed as a decimal on the seven segment display. That is, if we've written our sketch correctly, we should get a number here that corresponds to the image being displayed and the position of our switches. So as an example, switch number three would be on the right. One, two, three, going from left to right. Switch number three on the right would represent the so-called least significant bit. And so in a binary representation, it would represent the ones position. Then moving over to the left, switch number two would represent the twos position. And then switch number one would be in the fours position. And if we could continue this, if we had a fourth switch, we would have more combinations. So if we had four switches instead of three, then the most significant bit would be in the eights position. And then we would be able to address the binary representation of numbers from zero up to 15. But that's more than we need to worry about right now. We have our hands full with just three switches and eight combinations. Now, one very important point to mention before we try running the sketch, has to do with the bitmap data that we'll be using to draw on the OLED display. If you've already been through the software instruction for today, you'll have noticed that we improved the readability of the sketch by relegating the bulky bitmap data out to an external file. And you'll see this in the sketch line where it says hash include switch bitmaps.h. Now in order to compile and run correctly, 
the sketch needs to know where to find this external file containing the bitmap data. And so for this reason, you need to make sure to place the switch bitmaps.h file into the same folder on your computer where the .ino sketch file is located before you use the IDE to compile and upload your sketch to run. With that important detail out of the way, it seems like we're ready to go ahead and try out our work. So we'll go to the IDE and we'll upload our sketch and we'll have to wait a few moments for the sketch to load. And once it has loaded, we should expect to see something on our displays. And here we are. All right. So we see that it comes up with the display number of zero, which should correspond to the binary zero, all switches off. And that's how we have the, the switches configured. And the OLED correctly mirrors the state of the switches because we have an image here that detects three off switches. Now, we would expect that if we flip switch number one, that's the one on the left, that's the most significant bit, we would get one, four, zero twos, and zero ones, or in other words, image number four. So let's see if that works. So I'll reach in here and flip the leftmost switch. And sure enough, we get number four on our display and we get image number four, which mirrors the state of our switches. All right, likewise, we can activate image number two. So I'll go ahead and return that back to zero and flip switch number two. And that gives us binary number two and we get the corresponding image. And we can do that with the least significant bit taking the third switch, and that's the one in the ones position, and activate that, and we get the corresponding change in the image, and we're now looking at image number one. So, we can get additional combinations by having more than one switch in the on position. So, for example, if I leave the number three switch on, and then raise the number two switch. I now have one one and one two for a total of three, binary three, and we have the correct image. I have all three switches on. That's the binary seven. So there's image seven, there's the, the number seven, and there's the image seven. And I could continue to look at all the possibilities. So here's switch number two off, and so that corresponds to binary five and so on. So we see here that the displayed numbers and the images correctly correspond to the configuration of our switches. And that indicates that our wiring and our logic design were successful. So I hope that you were successful too. And we will see you for the next day's addition to our system as we add on and add functionality. So we look forward to seeing you then. As another cosmic day concludes, I can't help but beam with pride. Navigating the nebulous intricacies of binary and ensuring our hardware is primed and ready, you've tackled it all with stellar precision. It feels like just yesterday we were stranded and look how far we've come. But let's not let the stardust get to our heads just yet. Tomorrow awaits a crucial task, fixing our docking gear using knowledge from today. A smooth descent is the grand finale of our interstellar journey. Rest up and recharge will need all hands and switches on deck to ensure we land as gracefully as a feather in zero gravity. Until then, sweet celestial dreams. <laughs>